Hi, I'm Mark Ferrari from the bands Cold Sweat and Keel and the movie Wayne's World, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. You can find me at markferrari.com. He has been a real innovator in the music industry. He started in the 80s. He's had a couple of bands. He had Cold Sweat and evolved eventually into Keel with Ron Keel, the lead singer. You know, they had their time in the 80s. They were part of glam rock uh, cool guys. And he was really smart that he also segued into selling his music to universal music. Guitar songs and jingles that are used in video games and movies and TV shows and stuff like that. He was very smart to align with Universal Publishing way back then. And of course, he was also on TV, you know, doing shows, but I'll let him tell you a little bit about yeah. that. He's here and we should just bring him on and let him tell so, himself. So. And here he is in my I book heard. too. He's one of the portraits that I took for the book. A little bit about that portrait actually, because you can't see it in this photo, but he's actually holding a penny up. And there's a reason because his guitar is a 1968 Gibson Les Paul. Beautiful. Tell us how you got that guitar. Well, I've owned that guitar since high school. I bought that from another musician that lived in my hometown. I'm from a very small town in Western New York called Batavia. It's right between Buffalo and Rochester. And today it's probably about six feet under snow. <laughs> they got a walloping up there the last couple of days. But that's where I went to high school and you know, grew up and cut my teeth on you know all, all the great artists that helped shape who I am today. I had other Les Pauls prior to this. I had a tobacco. Les Paul Standard. I did have Les Paul Custom, a cherry Les Paul Custom. But this one, once I saw it, I just fell in love with the color. This actually started its life as a gold top. Oh, wow. uh, it was a gold top uh, originally, and gotcha. the person that I bought it from had it refinished. That was kind of a common thing to do back then because a lot of these 68s, uh, the bodies were left over from 1959, 1960. My guitar is, you know, one solid piece of wood on the back, um, split top maple. The neck is one piece of wood. They don't do that anymore. So I have a, a sneaky suspicion that my guitar was one of uh, those bodies that were left over from 1960. So uh, I've been that pr proud owner of that guitar now for 43 years. Wow. <laughs> 40 and he's holding a penny in the portrait. Yeah. Because how did you find that penny? That was an uncirculated 1968. <laughs> Uh, penny and I found that on the street and I was like this is just un it's unbelievable it was so shiny it was perfect I knew it was a sign <laughs> you know same year as his guitar yeah so I keep the penny in the case now so we've got both of the 68s hanging out together we've got <laughs> some some mojo in, in the case but he also had like an inner mojo way back when and was so smart and he had the opportunity to actually write music for the Olympic Games as well oh, wow. yeah so Lisa touched upon you know my career career trajectory. I moved out to LA in early 84 in the heat of the uh, the hard rock, you know, hair metal band era. You know, I don't know why they, they called our era hair metal when the guys in the 70s that I grew up listening to, the Deep Purples and the Zeppelins and Ted Nugent's all had longer hair than us, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I think everybody comes from, from hair rock. Uh, but anyway, so I moved out to LA in 84. I got involved with this band called Keel, started by Ron Keel. Ron's noted for bringing in Ingve Malmsteen from Sweden. Ingve came over in 1983 to join Ron's band Steeler. Steeler had a kind of re revolving door of uh, musicians. And so uh, you were saying about hair metal uh, was really from the 70s, but it just transitioned into the 80s. From... <laughs> they tend to call the uh, era of the early to mid 80s as hair metal. And I think it's maybe because because some folks believe that during that period of time, that there were some musicians that put more of an emphasis on the way that they looked rather than the way that they sounded. I don't know if I agree with that or not. Anyways, I had a pretty good career with that band Keel. We did four albums, two of them produced by Gene Simmons and Kiss and able to get a lot of touring in. We played with a lot of my heroes, got to open up for Aerosmith. Van Halen, toured with Dio. You know, we did uh, a month worth of shows with Bon Jovi on the 87 tour, uh, Slippery When Wet. Yep. It, it was a great experience and everything. And when the 90s rolled around and dials uh, changed and everything, I was uh, considered a fossil. <laughs> awesome. How you wrote for the Olympic Games? I segued into uh, starting a business that uh, created music primarily for film and TV use. And one of the music supervisors that I was working with was the supervisor 
advisor for the Olympics. Mm. One year, she came to me and she said, we're looking for a theme. We're looking for this song that kind of captures elements of emotion and feeling and teamwork and all that. And so myself and Paul Taylor, Paul Taylor from Winger, this other fellow named Stan Bush, who was uh, a recording artist of his own, we all put our heads together and we came up with this amazing song called Capture the Dream. That was a, written specifically for the Olympics in 1996. It wound up being used over and over again on that Olympics and many Olympics later. The Olympics also licensed some music from my library to play in background segments. Oh, cool. You know, like uh, segments on the athletes and stuff. How can we hear that song, Catch the Dream? Capture the Dream. Capture the Dream. One can Google Capture the Dream, Dan Bush, or Capture the Dream 1996 Olympics and find it pretty easily. And it was actually mixed by Michael Wagner, famous producer Michael Wagner, who did the last Keel album, but also did the first Extreme album, first Skid Row album, Ozzy Osbourne, Except, Dokken. Oh, just on and on and on. He mixed that song for us. And then he segued into film where he himself was a star in Wayne's World. <laughs> Which I was wondering why you look so familiar from your pictures, but it was because of Wayne's World too that I that I actually recognized you. Oh, I thought maybe it was that milk carton that <laughs> have you seen me lately? Yeah, so that's an interesting story. Uh, Wayne's World came about because I knew the director, Penelope Spheris, who directed Wayne's World 1. And how did I know her? Well, she directed a video for Keel. Keel was on MCA Records back in the mid to late 80s. Penelope had uh, directed a movie called Dudes with I think Flea was in there and John Cryer, who went on to big success with uh, Two and a Half Men, Daniel Roebuck, another actor. Those were the main actors in that film. We had the, the lead off song from the soundtrack and we did I don't he did a, a video for us called rock and roll outlaw which was a cover it was a rose tattoo song a rose tattoo that great australian band that even the guns and roses covered too so that's how i first met penelope and i stayed in touch with her throughout the years and i read that she uh, was hired to direct wayne's world one and initially i reached out to her just to see if i could help uh, with any background music and she said well i think i've got that part covered but i need two guitar players for the film this summer what are you doing this <laughs> I'm doing Wayne's World. <laughs> so, so cool. Yeah, and that, obviously that movie became, you know, such the cultural icon that it is. I don't think anybody had an inkling that it was going to become that when we were filming it, but it did. And then you were in the Wayne's World too, as well, right? That's right. The band that we were in is called Crucial Taunt. We were uh, the backup band for Tia Carrera. I had more of a prominent role in Wayne's World 1. We were in about six or seven scenes. Mm -hmm. And Wayne's World 2, we were just in two scenes. I got to work with Christopher Walken, though, on oh, <laughs> Wayne's World 2, showing him how to play guitar. And then Wayne's World 2 was Wayne Stock. Our band didn't play at, but we were waiting for Tia to show up. Was uh, she late to the set she, on a regular well, basis? No, no, no. Her character was late to the set because she was getting married. Oh. In the film, she was getting married and she went right from the wedding to the, the concert. So Sounds like something I would do. Yeah, <laughs> but interestingly enough, this is an interesting day that uh, we're doing this because Errol Smith was the headliner at Wayne Stock that day. Tonight, we are seeing Errol Smith That's in That's right. Vegas, That's so. right. And I photographed Brad Whitford's guitars for this book and also Joe Perry's are in Immortal Axis along with Mark's mm -hmm. guitar. It was my birthday last month and so for my birthday he asked Brad Whitford for tickets for us. So it's nice that you've maintained so many good relationships with your rock star buddies. So tonight we're going to Aerosmith, compliments of Brad Whitford. That's just amazing. I mean, you have such a history in the music industry as well too, Mark. You've already mentioned your amazing career as it is. And I, I got to see a few of your music videos as well too. So I, I loved, loved the style of the 80s. I grew up in the 80s myself. So I enjoy all of that type of uh, amazing music, uh, Zeppelin to ACDC to uh, Aerosmith as well. They were my high school musical soundtrack. So, I mean, we all oh, yeah. Yeah. I, and I was down in Florida recently at uh, Hard Rock International where they warehouse all of the artifacts for different cafes and hotels and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you walk in and it's just jaw dropping wall to ceiling guitars hanging there. But they also had a lot of cars that have been donated to their you know collection 86,000 different artifacts they have in the warehouse and I walk in and there's this beautiful Corvette that belonged to Faith Hill 
and Eddie Van Halen's Lamborghini. So I'm sending the picture to Mark and he goes, I drove in that car. <laughs> so yeah, he's got a rich past. And then on top of that, you're also an author too. Uh, that came about a little bit later in life. In 2002, I authored a book called Rockstar 101, which you can find on Amazon. You know, it's kind of a how-to book. You know, there's been lots of books written by attorneys and agents and other folks that have you know peripheral things in the music industry but there's never been one written by an actual recording artist you know in my case i started playing in garages and wound up playing in, in the garden that's madison square garden not, not the garden <laughs> yeah. throughout the years uh, kids would ask me you know how do you pick a manager or what does a publisher do do i need a publishing deal or you know i'm not sure what this means in this contract or i get all sorts of questions and finally i decided you know what i'm going to tell it how it is i'm going to tell my story from a guy that started very modestly and you know playing and playing in garage bands and you know getting a deal it's a sad truth that there's more business than music in the music business i think frank's that that quote is attributed to frank zappa and you know all too often young eager musicians are willing to sign anything to get that first break so to speak but a lot of folks don't realize is that sometimes these deals it's like getting your leg caught in a bear trap you know that's easy to get in it's not easy to get out and so I just wanted to share my knowledge, my experience of how a band can put a team together, what to look for, pitfalls and perils on the road and legal pitfalls and perils. And I wrote it in a very uh, non-denominational style, so it's not very legalese. Anybody who's not an attorney could read this book and, and pick up some knowledge from it. So that came out in 2002. <laughs> it probably could be updated by now. Fast forward about 14 years after I became a dad to a very precocious time challenged young girl i wrote a book called don't dilly dally silly sally which was an expression that just kind of came out of me one day as i was trying to get my daughter out of the house to school or wherever it was we were trying to go and that phrase just kind of came out of me and i don't know where it came from but i was like okay i'm gonna remember that because <laughs> yeah, her name's and, not sally and her name is not sally but her my daughter's name is sierra but i couldn't think of anything to rhyme with that very similar process to getting a record deal you know you write a manuscript you shop it to publishers lisa knows all about that in my case i got a lot of no's but i got one yes and that's all all it takes is one yes. So that book came out in 2016. I did a fair amount of TV interviews for it, which can be found on my website. It was kind of a love letter to my daughter, but I can't tell you how many people have told me that they have time-challenged kids or time-challenged siblings or time-challenged spouses, you know, <laughs> and that just a little gentle nudge sometimes can help things a lot. Being a musician, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? The language of music? Yes, the language of music. Uh, I think you can see that anytime that somebody is uh, mesmerized by a guitar player or, you know, or an artist. Like, I, I got pictures of me when I was 13, 14 years old playing at camp, you know, and there's a bunch of kids all around just listening, you know, and I think that is the power of music. You know, music to me, you know, music has always been my muse, you know. I was always drawn to music. There was something about it, you know, that just talked to my soul. That has an effect you know, on the average person too. You know, I think most people will tell you they listen to music, mm -hmm. you know, at some point in their life. So I was always acutely aware of the power of music. And I can tell you, my life was decided for me when I was 14 years old, when I went to go see Kiss, seeing that band up there and hearing them, the visuals, but also hearing that music coming out of those speakers and the bass thumping in the chest and the drums and the guitars and everything. It was like, that's, I got to I got to be, there's nothing else I want to do. You Kiss know? was my first concert at Me age too. 12. Yeah. 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 Edmonton at the Edmonton Coliseum and I made a, such a huge impression on me too and of course they were in all their makeup and costume regalia and it was such a, uh, an impression and then the second concert I had in the same summer was Alice Cooper. The third concert I ever saw when I was 14 was ACDC. Wow. Yeah, I was ruined forever after that. Well, as you saw all the classics there. <laughs> I think it goes without saying that, that just music affects humans in general. 
you know, I was going back to the, the Stone Age, you know, and I was always acutely aware of, you know, what music, you know, can do and you know how, how it can heal too. Music is used in healing processes all the time. Yeah. In your, your long and wonderful career that you've had, what are three things that you have accomplished that you're most proud of? And what are three things that you are looking forward to accomplish? Getting a, a major label deal, get, get, you know, getting signed, you know, look, I, I've been following my dreams since I was 14, you know, there's millions of people that you know choose the same path and not everybody's fortunate enough to be successful in what they they do but I, I had a goal I set this goal for myself this is what I wanted to do so you know obviously getting signed I think is a pretty proud achievement or validation of you know all that you work for putting all those hours of uh, uh, practice in you know I think that that was one of them you know the, the book was another because uh, that was something new to me you know I was a recording artist I wasn't an author up to that point in time but it was another thing that you know what I'm gonna write this manuscript I'm gonna shop it around to see where the chips fall, you know, and getting the book published. That was a proud moment. You know, I know my parents were proud too. Hey, the son's a published author kind of thing. You know, and I think also most people will tell you having a child or a kid and just being a good parent and raising a child to, to be a good person and pointing that person in the right direction and hoping that the ship gets sailed in the right direction. I think that's another thing too, you know. There's no manual for that. I can tell you that, you know, no manual for being a dad. I like to say when, when I moved to LA in the early 80s, I went from zero to 60 really quickly. Literally six months from the time I moved to LA, I had gotten signed and done two records. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, key, uh, the first Keel album and the Right to Rock was recorded in the summer of 84. When I got married and had kids, I went from 60 to zero pretty quickly. So, <laughs> just the reverse. But if you're asking me for like, you know, kind of things in my life that I'm proud of, you know, I guess, you know, the band, the book and the, the baby. <laughs> well, and it's a huge accomplishment to have sold your catalog to Universal. He asked for three, so <laughs> get him the top three, I guess. <laughs> you know, and along the way, I've, I've done some things that producing Pantera, you know, finding the band Pantera, bringing them to, uh, national attention for the first time and, you know, producing a, a couple songs for them. Those guys blew up to be one of the most important bands of that generation. You know, and the business thing that Lisa mentioned, you know, that was a byproduct of me wanting to put food on the table after my playing career had uh, drawn to an unceremonious close. It was like, what am I going to do? You know, in the 90s, when everybody was uh, wearing flannel and Doc Martens and, you know, looking down on their feet and shooting heroin, you know, I... That wasn't me. I had to figure something out. And, you know, fortunately, uh, I started getting some of my demo recordings used in these TV shows in films. It was uh, very organic at the start, but it was a match that start, started a fire. So the name of the business became Master Source, which was the first music library ever to feature vocals. So there were music libraries that were out there in the 60s and the 70s, but none of them had songs. If you were a TV producer and you wanted to license an ACDC song, it wasn't gonna happen. It's gonna be too expensive, take you forever to get it. Same with all the big bands, whether it was ACDC or Van Halen, or you know, on the pop side, you were trying to license a Garth Brooks song, just, you know, it wasn't gonna happen. So my idea was, you know what? I can create something for you that sounds generically similar to these guys. I'm not ripping them off, but it's, you know, creating something that, you know, close your eyes, it could be ACDC, it could, could, be, it could be Garth Brooks, you know, it could be uh, Tupac, whatever. But it, it wasn't ripping these guys off, it was just creating music that they would have created. And I was able to offer these tracks to the studios at a fraction of what they were gonna be paying and very quickly, you know, with, literally with uh, you know, a phone call. So that was my idea and it took off like a rocket. The business became known as Master Source and in 2007, I, I sold it to Universal. Wow, that's amazing, I love that. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, I gotta boil it down to one person. In the very beginning, the very, very beginnings, it was four people, it was the Beatles. The Beatles really were the first album that I got with my parents. I remember seeing the movie Let It Be in the theaters, that would have been 1969 or 70. So I guess really that kind of laid the seed for me being drawn to music. We'll go with one group, the Beatles. <laughs> Are featured in my new book, mm -hmm. 
taxes and I was so honored to be able to photograph and include mm. the Beatles in this book. Mm. This is John Lennon's J160E guitar that he yep. and Yoko Ono used when they were doing the bed-ins uh, in Montreal and in Amsterdam and he's got the little doodles of them on the front of the guitar. This was the guitar my dad wanted and he got and I now have. Um, John shaved off the patina on his and then we also have Paul McCartney's 1963 Hofner bass mm. in there and also George Harrison's Gibson SG that he used on the Revolver album and that John Lennon also used on the White album. So, I mean, the Beatles also influenced me, so that's like a nice segue, you know, that they were your number one inspiration and for so many others as well. Oh, an iconic group for sure. Well, I do hate to say it, everyone, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you all for coming on the show. Okay, except we're three geeks talking. Yeah, it's true. well, technically four, so, but yeah, I can't change the name. Three, three geeks talking. Mark on markferrari.com. That's Mark with a C, M A R C, markferrari.com. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. On our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And we have our link to Tree, which has a lot more social media links, which is linktree.com forward slash two geeks talking. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.